Hello everyone, welcome to I'm That Geek Show. We are about to get started. Here we go. <clears throat> Hi everyone, welcome back to I'm That Geek Show, the only show in the world that puts you face to face with the top thought leaders, CEOs, experts, and inventors in real time so you too can get actionable advice about your own relationship, your own business, your own health, and uh, everything else that we're chatting about. My name is Ifat Cohen, I'll be your host today, and we are chatting with the editorial, I'm gonna mess it up, Marcus, <laughs> chief <laughs> of Runway Manhattan, correct me. <laughs> <laughs> Editorial director at One Way Manhattan. You're joining us from Germany or you're in the US? Oh, I'm in Duluth, Minnesota, Minnesota. the fashion capital of the world. <laughs> I'm in Austin, the music capital of the world. So there we go. We're, <laughs> we're combining everything together, right? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so today we are going to chat about artificial intelligence and fashion. And what's fascinating about this entire journey is how uh, artificial intelligence is slowly kind of seeping into everything that we're doing in our lives, from our phones to maps to directions to uh, suggestions inside your um, Google Assistant, inside Alexa, inside wearables, but now it's even applying to fashion. And so if you guys want to join us in <clears throat> our show, hop on in to amathatgig.com forward slash live. You can hop on in and have a conversation with us in real time. So Marcus, uh, tell me, first of all, how did you become the editorial in chief of, uh, I'm messing it up again, of Runway Manhattan? Hey, Dennis, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I'm the first hire of uh, the woman that founded Runway Manhattan and the company. Um, she happens to be my business partner and she's also my wife, Lara Signorelli. She invented the concept of Runway Manhattan some seven years ago, eight years ago almost. And uh, that's how I ended up being in Runway Manhattan. I did not have to be dragged in. I was really on fire about the idea from the first moment that she actually invented the concept. So here we are, uh, still going strong and actually transforming the company to, into something very exciting and new right now. So let's talk a little bit about One Way Manhattan. Why is it different in the world of fashion from everything out there? So Run Way Manhattan is at, at first glance, nothing else than a photo agency. And uh, oftentimes, especially in the early days of Run Way Manhattan, we were mistaken for being a photo agency. You know? There are other photo banks out there. What is making you different? I can get a fashion photo from XYZ. Why would I buy it from Run Way Manhattan? The one thing that made Runway Manhattan different is keywording. That's what it's called in um, in the photo industry or in the editorial uh, playing field. Um, and you might know it as tagging. That's mm -hmm. what we do, right? We do hashtags on Instagram or we do hashtags everywhere we, we go today. And what Runway Manhattan did is we looked at a photo and we tagged or keyworded the photo from head to toe. So we described the fashion in the photo with actual natural language words. So That's you're the, you're like kind of like the original ones that started with uh, photo mapping, if you will, right? I don't know if we were the, the ones that started that in general. I don't think so. I think that there were many other smart people out there that <laughs> did that before us, but I think that we were the only ones that did that to such an insane, in quotation marks, level um, for fashion photography. So how does that work? Because when someone goes to Runway Manhattan, they look at uh, so many photos, right? And then they can search for that specific photo and you're only taking pictures in the fashion industry, celebrities, red carpet, um, styles, right? So how did that even come about? How did you get like all these photographers to go out and take all these pictures and then start tagging them and keywording them and actually making them available? 
out of past this in the fashion photography industry, or rather in the photography industry, both my wife and I grew up business wise or professionally within photography. Um, she had worked at the Associated Press at Getty Images. She had worked at um, Deutsche Presse Agentur in Germany. Um, I had worked at uh, several photo agencies, a couple of them being ones that I had founded myself. Mm -hmm. And we knew from experience that it was very difficult to discover the right content when you look at it. When you wanted to find a photo, something very simple. I want to find a polka dot dress that is worn by somebody during New York fashion. So how do you find that? Well, in any search engine, you would write uh, polka dot dress, New York fashion week or street style, and then hope that somebody has tagged that and then you will find the result. On our website, you will find a few hundred, that's my guess right now, images of a polka dot dress during New York Fashion Week out of 700,000 images roughly, which is not that many. Um, but if you actually get a result, that is, that is pretty good. So our, our experience from the past that we had seen that people were looking for the needle in the haystack, they yeah. were actually not able to find what they were looking for, that encouraged us or prompted us to say, let's keyword all the photos that we have. Don't add more photos to a stack of images that makes the haystack even bigger, but make it possible to find the needle in the haystack by being able to point it out. So that sounds like a very labor intensive work. Did you start building systems and computations to make that easier? <clears throat> we didn't build computations to do that. Actually, over the last five plus years, uh, we have spent some 90,000 hours um, creating that standard. Um, to go through 700,000 images takes a lot of time. Yeah. We, um, we had photo editors. We had a team of, at some point, we were 16 people in the company, and we did nothing else than looking at a lot of images and identifying every single fashion item in the images, whether it was a floor length dress or it's a knee length dress whether it's a uh, wavy hair or it's short hair or it's a uh, pixie cut, et cetera, brand names, et cetera. Um, 90,000 hours. And I, I did that calculation because I wanted it to be a little bit uh, punchy <laughs> when I first said that. It's one it's person lot. working 10 hours every day for 25 years straight. So yeah, it, it's a lot of work that went into creating that standard. And it consists of 48,000 different words that describe the fashion that we have in the archive today. And so would you consider yourself a fashion magazine or a stock images for celebrities and fashion or uh, an online magazine? What would you consider yourself? So we're not a fashion magazine. However, we do have a website that is called graysalon.com, G-R-E-Y-S-O-L-O-N.com. And Gray Salon is named after one of the, of the named after the guy who actually discovered and founded Duluth, Daniel Gresolon sur Duluth, a Dutch explorer from the 17th century. Um, that website is a kind of a magazine for us because it's our playground, it's our sandbox. That's mm -hmm. where we publish really interesting stuff. We can get back to that in a little bit. We predicted the color for next year Ooh. to be midnight blue. And that is an article that is on Gresolon right now. Rutland Manhattan as such is a business to business provider of fashion images. And it is a company that beyond images provides text and video. So we are a full service, um, we're full service fashion journalists, if you want to say that. Uh, Rutland Manhattan, among other things, is the content partner of Reuters, Thomson Reuters, Reuters Connect. Mm. Um, our team is so good that Reuters accepted us as the fashion channel on, on Reuters Connect. So clients in Nigeria or in Turkey or here in North America can find our stuff on Reuters and publish our images, our research, our texts, our videos, etc. That's fantastic. So you saw a need, your wife actually saw a need where a lot of uh... People are taking pictures of celebrities, of clothes or fashion, but it's very hard to find that specific picture that you want to use in your article 
in your magazine. And she started uh, tagging those images with keywords that describe the image from head to toe. It's a, it's a jeans jacket with a white shirt and plaid pants and skirts and stuff like that. And then it was very easy for people who are reporting about fashion to come in, find the exact image that they want and use that for their marketing. Is that right? That's exactly right. And now you can almost do the next twist yourself when you have all of that data collected. You have all of these images that have described who is wearing what on the red carpet. Then you can start asking questions. What is the length of a dress right now in average on the red carpets in Europe and on the red carpets here in the US? Mm. What is the preferred color in Europe? What is the preferred color during fashion weeks, whether it's New York or it's Milan or it's Paris? There's all kinds of interesting questions that you can ask that are interesting for journalists because you can write stories about it, but it's also interesting for fashion marketers, right? Right. And is that how you guys got into the idea of fashion brain, where you're looking at the trends and what people are doing and those questions and you're like, okay, we need to start creating something that uh, will help with that? Yeah, um, kind of. Um, there is a more mundane reason to that. Of course, I would be happy if I could tell you right now, gosh, if uh, we saw the future five years ago <laughs> and we could see that we, if we did that, we would be so and so successful. It's not that easy and that would be flat out a lie. So, But you know, it's a good story, so come on. It's a good story, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we did in 2016 is we talked about how could we automate the process, the really labor intensive and monotonous process of tagging images? If you think about it, one editor that is really good, and our editors here are you know, the top, uh, they, they are really good at editing fashion images and finding brands and tagging it, and they are fast at that. But even at their pace, they would tag let's say a group of 20 images mm -hmm. and it would take 15 minutes uh, to do that to describe all the fashion in the images from head to toe to call out the brands and to describe things so that you would that it makes sense um that's that's a lot of time that has yeah. to be spent yeah. on going through images and as you can imagine the amount of images doesn't necessarily decrease so there were more and more images if we now could teach a machine to do that if we could have a machine help us do the mundane part of it. Yeah. That would be awesome. So we talked to uh, some AI scientists in Amsterdam, brain creators. They have over the last three years become good friends, uh, great business partners. They have extraordinary talent that they have gathered and they have some amazing ideas on how we could realize that. And we took their AI domain expertise and we took our fashion data and combined that into an artificial intelligence that we called Fashion Brain. Um, and Fashion Brain first and foremost does that. It looks at images. It has been helped to understand what to identify in an image and what not to identify, mm -hmm. tags it automatically, and solves that very first problem of super labor intensive <laughs> work that had to be done to tag all the images. So that's that's the original reason that we started that. I, you know, I was thinking, I was like, so <clears throat> we say um, invention, uh, no, necessity is the mother of invention, right? After you get used to like so many times yeah. doing the same thing, you're going like, okay, there must be a better way. And you guys found a better way. You created Fashion Brain, but then it started evolving into what it is to today and it starts predicting trends is that right yeah that's that's right so it it um there's something that is that has been called intractable problems i only learned that expression recently so it is not um something that i've been familiar with for that that long and somebody told me that who used to work for cray research uh, another great company here from the midwest from minnesota and from wisconsin and what we what we found out is that now we were able to well, let me dial back for a moment. You can imagine if there is images that come in from New York Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what the trend that New York Fashion Week is, what is the most worn color? What is the most worn 
um, handbag, uh, right. or what is the what is the accessory right now? You need to look through all the images. Normally, as a human, you need to have somebody who has fashion knowledge and can say, yes, this is the same handbag, and this is the same color or color scheme, and this I can identify as a trend. It would take a lot of time, and it would usually only be completed days, maybe weeks after a fashion week is over. Hmm. When all the images are tagged live while it's going on, you have somebody who has 100 images or 500 images, and all of these images are tagged live right. in real time. You don't have to think about the time factor any longer, and you have all the data available. All of a sudden, it becomes possible to create live fingerprints of what fashion actually looks like, and you can see the differences while it is happening. So, so wait um, a second, let's talk about that for a second, because mm -hmm. trends are really interesting, right? Like trends don't uh, just start by, you know, like an influencer, one influencer, right? Going on going like, hey, buy that stuff. It has to become a massive, mass accepted idea, right? A lot of people have to like it. So how, will, how were trends created before fashion band? Like how would that come about and how will that even you know, for someone who's not really into the fashion thing, how do things become trendy? I, I would like, so I admire, and I'm glad that you think fashion brain can predict, predict trends. <laughs> it, it does that, but it does that on a very small scale. Of course, I would love fashion brain to become the trend predictor for the fashion industry as such. We think we have cracked the code for the future of fashion. Mm -hmm. Very simple. It's a very simple tool, but it's very powerful. But, um, there are other trend predictions out there and they are more powerful and much more well known than we are. But when we dial it down to fashion brain, what fashion brain does is it helps predict trends that are even that are interesting, even for small brands and are even interesting for small audiences. So in, imagine this in the in the past 25 years ago, and uh, maybe I don't have to go 25 years back, maybe only 10 years back in time, you had solid homogenous groups uh, of, of, of people that were reading a certain fashion magazine or were followers of a certain trend predictor. Vogue magazine, um, let's just take them. Everybody knows Vogue magazine or Elle magazine, that's mm -hmm. what, that's yeah. them as well, whatever. Um, a million readers, right? Or right. A, a circulation of a million copies. The same message that goes to a million people. Um, if you today look at what, uh, and, and that could, for example, then trigger a trend. You have a magazine like Vogue or a magazine like Elle that reports from New York Fashion Week or from Milan or from the catwalks in, uh, in Paris and says, this is a houndstooth that is going to be a thing next year. Or here is a color called goldenrod. It's going to be a thing next year or next season. So wait, so wait a second. So, so then, so the way that it used to work or was working is a magazine, a fashion magazine, or someone known in the fashion industry will say this will happen next season and that will start yes. creating the trend for next season. It, exactly. It would take a long time because you would basically have somebody predict that based on what had happened. And it was a top down decision, kind of. Right. And they can they can make up stuff, right? Like they can say my dress is going to be the trendy one next season. And then hopefully everybody buys the dress. Yes. And sometimes maybe that even happens because you predict it or because you say that's the way it is. And that is what happens. Yeah. Today we have a, a I don't want to say it's upside down, but it is clearly very different. We have a democratization of trend prediction, not even trend prediction, but of trend creation. We live in a we live in a social media age where yeah. everything that is visible is also immediately shared. Mm -hmm. Everything that is experienced is immediately made available to vast audiences. And that means that without influencers, whether they are large or small, saying that something is a trend, an audience can see, hey, I have seen bleached denim in 10 out of 50 images I have looked at over the last two days. Bleached denim might be a thing. Or I have seen dark denim in mm. 10 or 15 images out of 50. That might be a trend. So there may be something to pick from for everybody. 
and there may be a possibility that you can yourself start a trend by actually pushing something that you have seen not publicized by a large media company or by a classic influencer that had a followership of a million readers or more because they all got a copy of a magazine 10 years right. ago. Right. But today they have, you look at a group of 1400 or 14,000 Instagram followers and they can see something and decide for themselves. That's cool. I want to do that. Um, so there is a completely, a completely different approach to accepting something as a trend as well, right? Yeah, I love that. So um, that kind of means that we are we're democratizing fashion in a way, right? Because we're kind of like anyone can become a trendsetter um, if their if their photo or clothes and stuff is shared enough times, and other people start seeing it in their own feeds yeah. and like it, they can start becoming the the trendsetters. Um, but it also creates it so that because you choose who you follow you might only be seeing stuff that you're set to like, right? So you might not be exposed to what, uh, what's available out there because you are not following the right people. Is that right? That's, that's, that's a, big, uh, a, a big challenge, I would say. Um, maybe it's even a problem already that we live in these echo chambers. Mm -hmm. and sometimes only talk about echo chambers when we talk about opinion, whether it is religious or it's political or something but of course we also live in echo chambers in regards to every other topic that is there right because right. opinions that we have uh, are reinforced by the stuff that is shared with us right. or that we get presented as something that might be interested you know this is relevant you might also be interested in this you might also be interested in, in that all based on algorithms right. math right uh, that suggests something. Yeah, I, I, that's correct. So how, how is the fashion industry reacting to that? Because at the beginning, they were the ones setting the trends. And now we're living in echo chambers where it might be very hard for them to penetrate and kind of like show what they're doing, right? I don't think it has changed entirely yet. I think that there are some media companies who have been the trend makers mm -hmm. on behalf of fashion brands in the past. Uh, um, and in a positive way, right? Yeah. Um, they have successfully transitioned from analog to digital and have embraced all the new tools that we have at our disposal uh, to, to advocate trends or to publicize trends. Um, but what, what these new tools, and when we talk about artificial intelligence in general, right? Uh, for fashion brain, it is a very tiny sub segment of artificial intelligence, we only, in quotation marks, only work with machine learning. Artificial <laughs> intelligence is so much more. It's other things like natural language uh, generation or robotics and et cetera, right? Deep learning. Right. Um, that little sub-segment that we have provided is a tool that can help um, brands embrace this future and actually find a new way of engaging their audiences. As, as you know, it is very important that you genuinely uh, connect with people that you would like to continue to follow you. Yes. Um, that has maybe been the largest problem for some of the print media that have been around, that there was no competition for some time, or there was competition, but it was very different. And all of a sudden, with digital publications, it is possible to make smaller differences. <laughs> competition doesn't look that different right. it is just slightly different a a magazine that is published in north america might be published in 20 other countries and there are slight difference in in the editorial uh, way that it, that it looks with digital it's possible not just to make t t 20 different versions of it but you can make a hundred or you make, right. you make a thousand different ver versions of it so the fashion industry fashion publishing being a part of the industry that connects to consumers, to brands and to retailers um, has embraced that. And um, I think we will see that even more going forward that uh, we, and it is both good or bad, we come back to the challenge that you mentioned before, you know, that we get 
reinforced what we believe already. Um, we embrace that. I, for one, don't want to just be advertised to. I would like to be entertained. <laughs> when I look at an article in, uh, or when I want to read something about uh, leather jackets or, or boots or, or coats or bow ties or whatever it is, I'd not just have somebody uh, tell me, hey, you, here's a bow tie, you can buy it from me, but help me how to tie it, right? right. Help me to right. understand how yeah. I can maybe transition some of my old uh, uh, neckties into bow ties, stuff that is relevant for me. Right. If somebody can deliver that to me, I'm in. I'd like to follow that brand or that publisher or that retailer because they give me some value that goes beyond just an exchange, here's my money and give me the product. I love that because I am totally I'm totally there with you. I think we're moving away from information to connection and very much personalized, not to just in like, hey, you bought this jeans. Now here's 20 percent off uh, because we know you're going to a meeting, but inspiration and entertainment at the same time. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so Fashion Brain can look at these things right now and in a small scale predict where uh, things were, will be going. But before we, we talk about that, you and I have discussed the challenges of the fashion industry right now. Uh, you, you made me aware of H&M burning clothes because the whole cycle of from cotton to dye to creating the clothes to deciding what is fashionable to getting to the retailer. And then by the time we got to the retailer, maybe the train has passed. Right. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what are the challenges in the fashion industry today that artificial intelligence can help solve in the future? Um, yeah, let's talk about some of the challenges. Um, uh, two things, again, as a little preface, I don't think that fashion brain can solve all of these problems. I think that we can solve some and we can solve some that are really pressing. And uh, two, I think the fashion industry faces challenges that um, we are facing in so many other industries as well. If we, for example, talk about sustainability. Yeah. Right? Because one of the topics or one of the issues that people had with the fact that HMM was, um, had to get rid of, in quotation marks, uh, more than $4 billion worth of, of clothes. And I believe, if I remember correct from the articles that I read about it in Scandinavia, uh, they were actually used to to create energy, right? They were yeah, 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 yeah. They they turned it into they they sold, they sold it to power plants, which yes. to me is insane, right? Like, what happened to clothe the naked? <laughs> um, there are so many aspects that we have to take into account, and you know, I I'm not in the shoes of anybody at these uh, brands that makes the, this this decision. They might make a different decision today, but they had a situation where an enormous amount of clothes had been shipped to locations where it couldn't be sold. And at the end of the year, uh, they were stuck with dead stock worth billions of dollars. What do yeah. you do with that? You know, you can give it away. Yes. But what happens to the people who have bought a pair of pants that was $300 and then somebody else finds that as a find, finds that as a steal for, for $5 somewhere or gets it for free. That creates some tensions and some interesting, you know, the brand perception may be tweaked. There, there are some things to take into account there. So what, hold on a second. So you don't think they could have used this as good publicity? Like, hey, it's Christmas. Give it away? Yeah. yeah, it's Christmas. We decided, you know, to get to all the orphanages a new set of clothes, for example. <laughs> um, did you just mention Christmas? Yeah, I did. <laughs> you know, here, here's. Or it's Hanukkah, you know, whatever. It's New Year's. It's Valentine. Yes, okay. no, it's, it's a, no, that was not the reason why. But let's just talk about Hanukkah or let's talk about yeah. Christmas or any other occasion that is in whatever culture there is where you are nice to people for yeah. something. Right? <laughs> that is easy to be. But here's my personal point of view about that. Maybe we are that way um, for some periods of the year, but we may not always be like that. And there may be people who rightfully might be upset about that they have spent enormous amounts of money for a product that has been advertised to them as something where they buy into a lifestyle or they buy into a, an image. Um, and that is in, it doesn't take into regard whatever brand it is, whether it's a very expensive brand, a luxury brand, or it is a fast fashion brand, it doesn't matter. You buy into an image or you buy into a lifestyle 
and uh, you find out that um, immediately after, because it is the time of the year when you have to be nice to people, um, sorry, um, <laughs> that you then um, uh, see that that lifestyle or image that you bought into is available for free if you um, if it is um, undersubscribed. Let's put it that way, and there is stock that is left, right? I think that it should be turned around into something that is positive. I think um, that problem is maybe an unsolvable problem. How do you solve that and make everybody happy? You can't really do that, right? I, th I think it is, it, it's a conundrum that was, uh, it was doomed to fail. Whatever they did um, would have, would have gone, gone wrong. What, what we think fashion brain can contribute to that is to, in, in, to a certain extent and to in a small scale, we are, we are in the experimental phase of that right now, uh, if I may say so. Find out where your products are going to be desirable. Mm -hmm. And then do not send, do not ship stuff where there is a less where it's less likely that people will buy it. You can use AI to target consumers and have them buy it. But you can also use AI, machine learning, um, predictive analysis to see where is it more likely for my products to be bought? Is it in North America? Or is it in Europe? In what part of Europe? In what zip code in a city is it more likely? And that's very easy. A tool like Fashion Brain can scan through tens of thousands of Instagram accounts and create profiles of consumers. And before we all throw up our hands and say, ooh, that's bad, right? First of all, we give up the data. Freely, yeah. Freely, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had an interesting discussion with a group of Gen Z uh, students at, um, at uh, the University of uh, Minnesota a few weeks ago. And they clearly said, in other words, that they are willing to trade privacy for more relevance and for great and original experiences. So they are happy to give away data. Instagram is me or you giving up data about our preferences. That's what true. do we like? What have we posted? What have we shared, et cetera? Right. Our fashion brain can take thousands and only computer power limits that tens of thousands of accounts look through what kind of fashion have you liked? What kind of fashion have you shared? What have you posted yourself? And it creates profiles of groups of people, of neighborhoods, of zip codes, of cities, of regions in a country that can provide insights into where is it more likely that a product that I have can be, uh, can be sold. And that may be able to avoid some of the great initial mistakes in logistics if you are a, a company that sells shoes to ship a certain type of sneaker to an area where white sneakers are not what is going to be sold but it's black boots right yeah so it's interesting that you say that because a we give the information freely but then there are other technologies right that are coming up um and thank you angela for sharing the video um jump on in there are other technologies that are coming up kind of like facial recognition right and they're like the entire world is wired with cameras always filming people always taking images mm -hmm. Can we get to a point where fashion brain taps into that and then goes like, you know what? In Times Square, most people are wearing black boots. In uh, Tokyo, most of them are wearing skirts, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then start uh, scheduling, you know, like telling us that this is what merchandise needs to be sent to these areas. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that that would be possible. There are some privacy concerns and some technology concerns there, or not concerns, wrong, wrong word, sorry. English is not my mother tongue, obviously. <laughs> Mine neither. It's big, okay. big German accent here. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I believe that there are um, some, um, some challenges in that as, as well. I had a conversation with a gentleman uh, yesterday in, uh, in Minneapolis. They have, uh, they're the founders of a great co-working space that is called Third House. Uh, Chris and Anne uh, founded that, and they have a retail lab connected to their co-working space. And they 
want to bring people together who are into everything retail. And he and I uh, discussed, Chris and I discussed that for a moment. What if you knew more about the consumers that are coming into your shop when they're coming in? You know, whether if, if there maybe was a live stream, for lack of a better word, of the information that is available, the social media profiles that people have, where they willingly, in exchange for a better shopping experience, in exchange for better entertainment, in exchange for more relevant uh, information, are willing to give up data about themselves. And, um, and that is available to you as a retailer that would make the, the, the shopping experience completely different, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, it would be possible to do that. Whether you have to hook that into uh, surveillance um, cameras, or you even can do that, I don't know about that. I also think that that is what I would usually call future music, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you know, it's interesting because we are, we're, it's kind of like a cash 22, it sounds like. Because on one hand, we are living in those echo chambers and we're, you know, only aware of what's happening around us and f from a social media point of view, right? Because we're deciding who to follow. Uh, unless we're buying magazines and actively seeking things outside our comfort zone. And then we have technologies kind of like fashion brain that are looking at what everybody is buying and on a small scale predicting those trends. But um, will those trends be able to tell the merchants what to buy with enough time that it's still trendy and they still buy the merchandise and it's not kind of like, well, now you know, technology changes so quickly and now this is old news and now I like this new thing that just came up. <laughs> That's a question about the speed, right? Yeah. I, um, again, I had a discussion with somebody else a few days ago about the carbon footprint of, of the fashion industry. And yeah. we uh, looked at some data about um, what it takes in terms of um, greenhouse gas footprint to produce cotton, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe, and, and sometimes as humans, we have the tendency, and this, I don't intend to, this to get uh, philosophical here, but we have the tendency to see a problem and then we need to solve it today, right? Yeah. Or we need to solve it tomorrow. That's usually not possible because if a problem has taken a generation or two or more to actually manifest itself, um, it would be wise to assume that it's going to take some time to solve it and some brain power put at it to actually solve it. So I think it will take some time to solve the, the, the problems that we that we have around us if there is too much uh, clothes shipped to one location and there is dead stock at the end of the season or um, there, there are sustainability questions around uh, um, uh, the fashion. But imagine an age where you have um, a 3D printer, whatever that may be. I don't even know if that is available at this point that can produce the fashion that you would like to wear right there on the spot. Yeah. Uh, for you or for your family. And it is recycled when you don't want it any longer. Uh, that would, that is obviously nothing that can be, you know, um, available on a global scale right now because the technology is not there our mindset is not there right i i like to go out and buy my clothes the way that we have done it i have done it for the last 30 40 years my parents have done it before me but who knows maybe somebody who's born today will shop his or her clothes differently 30 years down the road um and that is the time frame that we should see in front of us there will be problems that people will solve when I'm no longer around, and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the one of the uh, conversations around the sustainability of the fashion industry and the waste, right? So many people are just buying stuff and they're wearing it once, and that's it. Um, new services are coming out in terms of renting clothes, right? Yeah. So now you can instead of spending so much money, you rent the clothes, you wear it for one occasion or two, and then you send it back. How is that? Um, how do you see that affecting the the fashion industry? Um, so I have, I'm biased there. When you say, how do I see that affect the fashion industry? I say, or I see an opportunity for fashion brain. Um, 
there are companies that do personalized uh, shopping, right? And mm -hmm. buying vintage clothes or, or second hand is very personal. Yeah. Um, why not get the story about a piece of clothes that you are about to buy with the help of fashion brain? Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that is continuously my, it's my favorite thing about fashion brain. It's the only fashion AI in the world, to my knowledge. And I try to Google it all the time to see if somebody else has caught up. But we are the only fashion AI in the world that uses natural vocabulary to describe fashion. Hmm. So if something is a polka dot dress, if something is a white brim hat, or it is combat boots or whatever it is, we recognize it with the actual word. Now imagine that you go out in your, uh, you go out to, um, to buy some vintage clothes or you go out to buy some second hand and you, you shoot a photo of it and your, your phone identifies the fashion item that is in front of you live while you stand there. And it comes with all kinds of information about it. Hey, what you are standing with is a vintage Gucci coat or what you are standing in front of is a pair of um, great broke uh, shoes that were made in Amsterdam or they were made in, in Hungary or whatever, uh, wherever they were made. Um, and some interesting context around that that helps you increase your shopping experience. Um, I would like that. Yeah, I, I love it. I believe that thousands, tens of, tens of thousands of consumers, many consumers would love that as, as well. And that is what is going to be enabled by that. What we have seen Fashion Brain do over the past six, eight, ten months is a tiny, tiny little corner of what its potential actually is. We believe when we say that we have cracked the code to the future of fashion, it is applicable to so much. Yes, it can help fashion brands make decisions on what is trending right now. It can increase my shopping experience or yours by giving you very personalized information that it gathers from other sources because it knows what you're looking at. It knows that if you're looking at four or five items and they are all black and all white, that you're looking at monochrome style. It can give you a hint on monochrome style is just in right now or nah, it was in two years ago. Maybe you should look into uh, a more uh, different color scheme, etc. right? So there are there's an enormous array of um, there's a there's an enormous potential in uh, in applying that and making things more sustainable yes but also more palatable more enjoyable and that's what at the end of the day fashion is all about right yeah. it is something that we should it should be fun yeah um, so two questions one one to your uh... To your point, I was sitting with my son today at school at um, a Thanksgiving dinner that they have, and he brings a, a, a Hot Wheel car that looks like Yoda from Star Wars, mm -hmm. and he loves Hot Wheels, right? And he goes like, "Well, I can't, uh, I can't play with it because it's uh, um, collectible, right? Because it looks like a really nice Yoda thing." And I'm like, "Is it really a collectible?" So I go online, right? I Google, and it's like five bucks. And so I show it to my son and I'm like, I don't think it's a collectible. And he goes like, oh, great. So he opens it and he starts playing with it, right? And it's no longer this fancy thing that has to be kept in a box and not touched or anything like that. So knowing exactly what you have in front of you, whether it's, you know, um, uh, Whitney Houston skirt, right? Or is it just something different? Is it, yeah. you know, <laughs> what the story behind it really matters, right? Because we do get emotionally attached to things. Um, so when you say you crack the code on fashion, dive a little bit more into that. What do you mean by that? What is the standard fashion experience today? When you think about that you were advertised to, mm -hmm. you look at a photo and let's say that there is a famous celebrity that is wearing a, let's make it very simple, black shoes, red skirt, white blouse. Okay. Yeah. Next to it, you see shop the look. Right. 
immediately when you are looking at, an, at a photo and you have stayed on the website for just 10 seconds, or you just go to the site, what is, what is, what is happening is that you're advertised to. Right. It's a very blunt way of give me your money and you can have this and you can look like that. I'm tired of that. And I believe that that's the case from almost every other shopper that is out there. I don't want to be advertised to. Yeah. We have very, very smart algorithms that find out what we're looking at. And then they say, here's more of that. The problem with that is if I bought a cage or a crate for my dogs yesterday, I will get ads for crates for dogs <laughs> no. for the next month, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a waste, it's a waste of, of advertising space and it quite frankly annoys me. Yeah. So the, to crack the code to the future of fashion for us means that it looks into all the aspects of fashion. Fashion is visual. Yeah. How do I find relevant um, imagery that can tell a story about fashion in a great way? Fashion Brain solves that because you can say or type what you're looking for with plain language, with the language that people in the fashion industry speak. No mathematical formulas, no algorithms, no X, Y, Z, A, B, C, one, two, three, plain language. I'm looking for photos of people in uh, festival style. Boom, and you will get that. Hmm. The other aspects of that is, with that being available, you can create amazing content that has the same effect in the end, or a better effect in the end than advertising has. You can create content that is so compelling that I feel attracted to a brand. I feel attracted to a publisher because they know me yeah. and they entertain me in a way I want it. I may be on my phone and I get short form content where it's just a few images and short lines. I may be on my desktop computer and I get the whole entire story about a fashion trend. Um, we have all the means today to adapt content to different audiences. We just don't have the tool to choose how we can um, find the content. Fashion Brain makes that possible. Go to retailers and brands. Retailers can, with Fashion Brain, learn what is in and where live. Yeah. They can learn it from their own photo databases. They can learn it from social media. Um, I think in 2019, the number is going to be 1.7 trillion images that we have taken over the course of the year. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable, right? I know. Yeah. And almost two thirds of that are images that are social images that are that's images that we have taken and that we have posted to social media platforms. That's an enormous amount. All of that data is the moment that it is published or that it is captured unstructured. Fashion Brain helps structure it and creates completely new and unprecedented experiences with that content. Uh, that's what we mean by we have cracked the code to the future of fashion. No doubt the fashion industry has to take into account that we want to be treated much more personal in the future. We want to have a personal relationship with brands. I love that. I love I love that uh, a lot because it's uh, um, a it will help the planet. Right. And it's kind of like, you know, watching mm -hmm. Netflix, right? There is a difference between watching watching Netflix and watching Amazon Prime. Netflix, for some reason, just doesn't doesn't have the ability to like tune in to what you like and give you good suggestions where Amazon seem like they mastered it and like are dominating the um, suggestion engine. We're like, oh, you watch this one and here are a few more things that you probably like. Or Netflix is like completely off. So you're bringing that into the fashion industry and to social imaging and to the, the social life. What do you see like is the future? Do you think we're going to be walking around with like glasses or embedded chips or stuff like that? That's kind of like you walk or like, you know, in your phone, because I've seen those ads where you walk down the street and like ads and billboards are changing to your preferences. And you're the only one who can see that billboard and a different person sees a different ad on that billboard or the store. Oh, or I had not seen You that. haven't seen that? No, I have not. I just remember this one scene from the movie Minority Report. Yeah where the main uh, character 
is walking into a store and has the eyes of a different person and retina scan identifies that person and he is identified as a uh, as I somebody else yeah <laughs> and here's your last uh, ex experience you know it's it's difficult to say or let me let me say, let me say it this way we are lay people in terms of artificial intelligence we are we have expertise in visuals on on fashion that's our domain expertise <laughs> in terms of technology i have some crazy thoughts what technology will be able to do while i'm still alive and what it will be able to do in the next 50 or maybe 100 years we have been surprised so many times about things that technology has been able to do way earlier than we thought yeah i, I think some of the things that you just mentioned may very well be just around the corner and they also should be why should technology not be able to cater to all of us in a very personal manner um of course there are a lot of questions about that about privacy um and there is also pushback um but it seems that a lot of people many of us embrace this technology progress that is there and the ability to make use of modern technology to actually create the experiences that we want bad or good or indifferent i don't want to judge on that but that's where it's going so so let's let's uh, play with that a little bit like towards the end let's get philo let, philosophize just a little bit right um so technology is technology, right? Like nuclear is nuclear. It's the way that we use it as humans that makes it good or bad for, for us, right? We can take nuclear and hit our homes or we can blow up uh, people. And technology is just the same, right? So we need to look at deeper issues, kind of like ethics and society and culture and uh, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And so you're in, uh, you're in fashion industry. So let's talk about that for a second. You're saying that Generation Z is totally okay with giving up privacy for convenience and experiences. Um, but it also could be just because they're growing up with machines, right? Like my son, he's 10, he's, he doesn't need to type. He's like, okay, Google, and then he just starts talking and now he has a relationship with a machine, kind of like the movie Her, right? And my phone just pops up with the, <laughs> okay, Google. <laughs> so um, so if that's, that's the case and we're kind of like getting... Um, getting very comfortable with where with technology being you know like an a seamless part of our life right on our bodies maybe chips maybe uh glasses maybe clothes that we're wearing there you go google is like <laughs> listening um so in, in in that spec today today our i think our society is not really ready for uh for technology like that right because it's not sitting in benevolent hands that are ethical um, hopefully that will change. But in today, where you're looking at fashion and we're looking at people who are interested in that, what are the, the challenges that we have with that type of a technology that, you know, does tap into our privacy, can change the way we look at trends, can affect what we're looking at because of echo chambers? What do you think is happening today? And what do you think needs to happen in order for that to be, you know, a force for good, not necessarily a force for, for control of the masses? That's a uh, <clears throat> very good question. I'm a born optimist and I'm a positive person. So I would rather look at the forces for good and what we can do with things that are, that are positive and that can contribute to things becoming better mm -hmm. for all of us. Um, I think it would be wrong to reduce the outlook to just fashion. I think that there is a, a, a more general, um, a more general attitude that is that we should look at towards technology. Are we willing to and are we able to integrate technology in our daily lives? And are we accepting the level of privacy increased or decreased that it, that comes with it? Are we willing to going forward to accept the inconveniences? of not having technology or the conveniences of having technology with maybe less privacy to reduce that to fashion alone. Um, 
No, so the, the only reason I was asking about fashion because that's that's your niche. But yeah, let's let's talk about everything. Um, I'm not a digital native. I was born before email. I was born. Uh, I, I was thinking I was born before color TV came. Color TV came out. So I was born in 1966. I'm 53 years old. Digital natives that are Generation Z. Um, they look at technology in a completely different way. And in a way, my personal opinion is that despite the fact that we sometimes, because we are older, I'm not really old, but I'm older. Wiser, wiser. <laughs> we want to make the decisions and we feel like because we have more, we have a higher number in our age, and we need to make the decision. <laughs> Some of these decisions should be left to the people where they're going to make more of an impact, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that's not decisions that we necessarily should make or I should make if it influences my my sister's children or their her um, her grandkids more than it would influence me. We can guide. We can talk about experiences from the past where we say this, you know, be aware of that. It can go wrong. It has gone wrong yeah. with other technologies, uh, but also be open-minded. You know, technology has... As, as its advantages, enormous advantages, you're right if it is in the right hands, but we should also trust that um, our our basic drive is to make things better, right? Yeah. And not to mess it up. Yeah. So let's let's uh, let's finish with this. What do you what is your vision for fashion brain? Where do you see that going? The vision for fashion brain is. So we have a we have a vision for for us. Just you asked me where I was, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in Duluth, Minnesota, and Duluth, Minnesota is not necessarily known as the fashion capital of the world. So that joke was uh, on me here. Um, <laughs> I think that Fashion Brain has the potential to bring us as a company and Duluth as a location where we have developed this to the attention of people everywhere. We have clients today that are on the East Coast and West Coast in the US. We have clients in Italy and France and Germany and Dubai. So they know Duluth and they know Run Manhattan already. Fashion Brain will expand that uh, even more. So we have, a, we have a local vision for our community. We said at some point, we want to make our uh, city here in the Northern part of the Midwest, the, uh, an international hub for fashion entertainment. I think that um, we can be a hub for fashion intelligence that connects uh, with what we have built here. But internationally, um, as, a, as for, the, for the brand, for our company, I think that within a year or two, fashion brain will become a standard that people will use to catalog the data that they have and with the structured data that comes out of it, they will discover that there are so many things that they can do that they were not able to do before. And that will make us um, very successful. Yeah, so, you know, I just had a, a, a thought. So one of the things around fashion is um, is the fashion shows, right? That's a big deal. Yeah. Everybody's <clears throat> going there and then that's where trends are predicted and you mingle with people and it's a big experience. What happens when um, fashion brain is where you want it to be two years from now, right? And everybody kind of becomes, uh, gets the trends on the phone and see exactly what they want in the store that they want. Do you think that's going to affect the way fashion shows are happening right now? It will change them in any way? Maybe people don't need them anymore because they, they see the fashion changes in real time on their, on their phone and in their feeds? I think fashion shows will continue to be there. There is a certain atmosphere at fashion shows there's an excitement it's a way for designers to get in front of audiences it is the way to celebrate the craft of creating clothes um, there is the chemistry between the audience and the models and the designers i think that that will continue to exist and i think it should be um, but you asked me where's fashion brain in two years I, let's talk about something that i can envision in connection with a, a fashion show just a crazy, uh, a crazy idea. You know, these old passport image machines that were at yeah. railway stations and at airports, right? Right. 
I can imagine, I would love it if that was possible and if we could create that. A machine like that, that looks vintage and looks old, <laughs> and the way that you check in is via your phone. Yeah. You sit down in it and you take photos and it could be full length photos. It's not just sitting down and taking a portrait of you because fashion is a full body mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, you take photos and the photos are automatic tagged. And if your phone has given the machine the uh, ability to post to your Instagram, to your Facebook, to Snapchat or whatever social media platform is popular at that time, it would automatically do that. And all the images are tagged and it is, uh, it connects you with people who have a similar taste in fashion and stuff like that. That's something I can imagine as a little, very little fun. Yeah. Personal application. It could be cool. It, uh, it's, um, it's like you saying, right? Um, the privacy and convenience, these two things that we're playing with and technology, um, used in a way not to invade but actually to entertain and support and uh and educate yeah. right that'll be that'll be interesting to see what what powers like you know uh, where facebook is going where amazon is going where h m is going where all these you know all these industries are going and who, who's going to emerge as like the benevolent dictator if you will right, right. because if they control all the data uh, they have a lot of power in their hands right So, um, so thank you, Marcus. This is fantastic. It's fascinating. And it's really fascinating to chat with you before the, the big blow, right? Like this is what's about to happen. And a year from now, two years from now, uh, we can go back to this and be like, look, we talked about that and now it happened. It's really let's, fantastic. Let's hope that we got it right. And let's hope that the predictions are going to match what is going to happen. Maybe it's going to go into a different direction. And um, we have been surprised in the past. We created Fashion Brain to solve some of our own problems. And all of a sudden we find out, whoa, we can apply this to something that is much larger and we can solve problems and help people approach their challenges with this. Uh, who knows what we are going to discover in the year or two that is going forward. So yeah, let's stay tuned. Yeah, yeah let's stay tuned. Let's plan another one for a year from now, kind of like a review of, uh, did it happen? Did it not happen? <laughs> so uh, thank you so very much for, for joining me today. I know you had a a big trip and you came for let's just share with everybody right you were nominated for an award um which is fantastic right in the artificial intelligence um, that's right in cognitive computing yeah yeah which is really great so you're already putting <clears throat> your mark out there as one of the upcoming uh technologies to look at and you have, you know just by being nominated that's a seat at the table so that's fantastic um, i'll let you know when we win next time how's that i why not? I'll vote for you. Next time, let me know. You got my yeah. vote. <laughs> so thank you so much once again. Thank you, everybody who's watching. If you are interested in seeing more about Fashion Brain, it is in beta right now, right? It's not available. It's kind of like in silo. You can go to Fashion Brain AI. You won't see much there. So how can they follow you and how can they can stay uh, up to date with connect, what's changing? Connect with me on LinkedIn um, or send me an email. My, the best email to reach me is Marcus with a K at runmymanhattan.com or find me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to chat. Which is why exactly how Marcus and I met. So here's proof that if you find him on, wink, on LinkedIn, you will be connected. Um, so thank you once again so much uh, for being here. Thank you everybody who's watching, re-watching the replays, connecting, commenting. Thank you, Angela. She was saying she's watching us. Uh, and thank you, sir. Have a fantastic weekend and a good Thanksgiving. The same to you. Thank you. Thank you. You as well. Bye-bye.